I'd like now to open to the uh, audience to ask our panel questions about the science of the Mediterranean diet, about some of the components about the Mediterranean diet, and about how the challenges of, of, of improving people's health in the context of the Mediterranean diet can be overcome. So I'm not sure, do we have a roving microphone? Or, yep, yeah, we've got a roving microphone. So can I have any hands of anybody who's got any, any, any questions for any of our panel members? Okay, well, if there are no questions so far, I'm sure you will all think of some, but I, I've, so I'll kick off by, by asking a question of the panel. Um, at the moment, there seems to be uh, a, a, a fashion that um, there are some people talking about revision of our understanding of saturated fat and also of carbohydrates. And there is a new uh, narrative around the Mediterranean diet which some people are promoting, which is that it actually is a low-carbohydrate diet which has saturated fat in it in the form of dairy, for example. Um, and so my question is, what is the role and place for carbohydrate in the Mediterranean diet and also for saturated fat? Oh, okay. Um this is my, my um, answer, but I think it's answer related to Mediterranean diet, because Mediterranean diet is uh, the basis of Mediterranean diet is carbohydrate. So we need, you need to remember, because this is uh, written in every book uh, of history, in every la the Last Supper uh, paintings, as we showed, but also in the, in the, in the famous book of Ansel Keys, uh, there, were, there was written plenty of bread plenty of bread. Now we have a consumption of bread which is about 80 grams in Italy, the lowest consumption ever in, in the history. So this is not real because the Mediterranean diet is carbohydrates. What we need to talk about is the quality of carbohydrates. So we don't have to say carbohydrate is evil because carbohydrate is not evil. What changed in, over the last uh, century is the quality of carbohydrates. So we changed, we moved from uh, a non-refined to a refined, to a very highly refined, to the quality of grains, as uh, Professor Tricopolo said, and as we, we reported in our, uh, in our papers. Uh, so the quality of grains is completely different. So what we probably need to talk about is the quality. It's like fats, it's the same thing. We demonized the fats, like saturated fat for 40 years, cholesterol for 40 years, and now we, we restore the, the, the concept of, of cholesterol. This is, in my opinion, it's just because uh, we don't have to see at the isolated nutrients. The isolated nutrients is a, a failed uh, theory because we don't heat just cholesterol or just carbohydrate or just grain or just something. We eat all the things in common, so probably the cholesterol I have from uh, 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 animal products combined with olive oil determine a reduction and then probably Francesco will tell you something, will tell us something. So there is a, a combination of uh, isolated nutrients together that makes the diet uh, good or, or not good. Fat. No, I just, I just wanted to add something uh, on saturated fat, because yeah, people are confused. We, we, no, no, they were evil for what, f 40 years, and, you, and now, now you can eat butter. The problem with, when we study fat is that there's no fat per se. F one fat replaces another one, so it's really difficult. And, and now we are when 2017 to say that saturated fats are good or bad, to say that monosaturated fats are good or bad. If you eat one, you don't eat another one. So it's very difficult to talk about one individual class of fat per se. Uh, if you don't eat butter, you eat more olive oil. Then, is that bec and then you see an effect, good or bad, whatever. In this case, good. But do you s is that because it's, it's all the fat in olive oil that is good and the other one is bad? Or, or, or vice versa. So if you substitute saturated fat with poly and saturated fat, mono or even better poly, then you see a health effect. We still don't know uh, whether it's, this is because one is good and the other one is bad or it's just because we replace. So when we do study with just one kind of fat, you, usually we replace carbohydrates equicalorically. Very complicated because fat is, has more calories than carbohydrates 
So you take fat out and you give more carbohydrates, a quick caloric to see an effect. So again, when you read the press, my goal today is then you go home, you read the newspaper, well, <laughs> but well, yesterday they said one thing and today they say exactly the opposite, uh, <laughs> which happens very often. Very, it's very, very difficult to study nutrients, as we, as we saw, because we, it's very easy to study the effect of, of paracetamol. You know, I have a little bit of back pain, I take paracetamol, either it works or not, or maybe. But if we, when we, when we study diets, we talk about replacing one nutrient with another one. And then it's very difficult to attribute the effect to, to, to the lack of one or to the addition of, of the other one. This is, you know, just, just, just to just to clarify a little bit uh, things or maybe to confuse them even, <laughs> even further thank thank you very much um should we do you, do you have a, a, any observations antonio you don't have to uh, if you oh, wish to well uh, well i have to make uh, are we talking about mediterranean diet or diet in general I, I and uh, i have some comments because uh, uh, my friends uh, francesco <laughs> He was attacking in a way the, the, the epidemiological data, but through epidemiology, uh, we know the epidemiology opened big windows, and then we proceed, proceed and we try to find the mechanisms. And on the other hand, by focusing on uh, components or on several nutrients, we miss something that uh, what we have found from many, many epidemiological studies, not only in Greece, but everywhere, where Francesco did an excellent meta-analysis in British Medical Journal, we found out that the protective effect of Mediterranean diet is the pattern. And if we look at the individual foods, the protective effect uh, does not have such statistical association as the pattern. The pattern is peaks. Because, because apparently in our body, the various nutrients uh, or foods, they interact. For example, we are drinking wine during the meals. We do not have binge drinking. That means that the wine in our stomach interacts with other foods. And by interacting with other foods, facilitate the absorption of some nutrients. Nitric oxide, I have in mind. So, it's not so simple. When we focus in on nutrients, it's excellent but in order for our scientific interest, not for public health. In order to find out the mechanism, like the epigenetics, which he mentioned before, for our day-to-day -day advice, we need to speak about the patterns and to try to avoid the magic bullets, which they are developed through the scientific study of the various nutrients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and any other questions? And in any language, it's only people like me who sadly are terribly ignorant of other languages that this conference needs to be in English. I apologize. But you know, questions in Italian, we will translate. Questions in any language, Welsh, you know? You want to ask a question in Welsh? I'm from Wales. You can ask a question in Wales. Welsh, I'll, I'll translate it. Any, Greek, uh, Greek. any other questions from, from the floor? Yes, please, Maria. And if you introduce yourself, uh, that would be helpful as well. Hi, thank you very much. This is Montaña Camara from Spain, from the Complutense University. I, I completely agree with uh, Professor Francesco Sofi about the necessity of a, a new approach for, for health claims. But um, it can be possible that there will be also, uh, people will be overwhelming with all the positive uh, claims of the different food because it's not there to say don't eat this, don't eat that. But now we say you have to eat uh, 30 grams of fire, you have to eat uh, how many nuts, you have to eat olive oil, you have to drink wine, you have to, and some people say I don't have time over the day to intake all of this food. So it will be <laughs> something in the middle, no? Not just, yes, it's, you have to, no, 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 you can eat these nuts and or eat or no, 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 because it's not at the end. It says I don't have time to eat all the things that scientists says that are good for us. No, maybe. Yes, that, thank you very much. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think that um, now 
in the last 20 years, we created um, a monster, just uh, pass me the term, uh, we created a monster in a nutrition because the person either doesn't like uh, uh, eating, so they just eat for, uh, for nourish, or they are they have a disturbance of food. So we don't have the middle. We have just the person who uh, are obese, don't like uh, eating, and just uh, eat uh, rubbish things, or they eat uh, very, very, very good things. In terms of uh, um, food disturbance, so we create all, we coined all the terms of fat diet, so every time uh, new terms, we have a dambulatory full of person who eat uh, in a strange way, uh, different from each other, so there was, there's something we need to change. I mean, I think is one of the solution is to change the medical approach. So, I mean, the medical, we shouldn't avoid, we should avoid, sorry, to, to link the medical aspect to nutrition. So, because the, the person think that they, they can have all, this, all the nutrients in one pill and uh, live for a longer life. But this is not the, the, the solution. The solution needs to uh, take importance to the foods, but not too much importance because it's created a lot of madness in this way. And so we, we, we have to, uh, to place the food in, a good, in, a, in the first position of our, of our uh, culture, of course, but not to say what to eat and what not to eat because I think that person knows what to eat and what not to eat. It's just like a smoking habit. The person knows they don't have it to smoke. So we don't have to say a lot of times uh, don't smoke. We need to change the behaviors or the environment or with uh, other things in terms of avoiding uh, this restric restriction. Yes, Antonia? Well, here we are in Italy, and I mean, uh, uh, among the audience, there are uh, many persons of my age, I mean, the older generation. How you learn? Who taught you to eat Mediterranean? In our house, in the environment, in day practice, we never thought. We never thought. When we go back home and something smell, I say, oh my goodness, this smell is, my, is bean soup, fresh bread. So, but nobody taught us. We are, so it's a societal issue. It's to give the example, to be a day-to-day -day living, and to teach that at home, to cook at home Mediterranean way at least in our countries. As for the other countries, uh, well, there are many other ways, it's not, but, but, but for us to keep what we have learned and transmit that to our children, of course, through arts, through culture, through festivities, it's very, very nice. But the first of all is remember how we learn to eat Mediterranean and why our children, they do not. Completely agree. <laughs> Thank you. And, and interestingly, we've covered a couple of issues with, with, with in this debate so far, which is one that we should talk about food, not nutrients, food values. And the other thing is that um, Francesco just described the fact that we have created a terrible period uh, of nutrition. Um, and we are living, I think, in the dark ages, the Ani Oscuri, is that right? The dark ages of food, uh, and we have lost so many of these traditions, and of course we need a renaissance, which is the reason uh, for this uh, uh, conference. We need a renaissance in, in the way we approach and the way we think about food, so that we can rediscover some of these traditional heritage, heritages that are at risk of being lost. So any other questions or, or comments, please just contribute to the debate if you have some thoughts on some of the questions that have gone forward. Yes. Uh, yes, I was just going to say that um, with regard to smoking, smoking, it wasn't until huge lawsuits in America that um, awarded billions of dollars to people that smoking became something that was unfavorable and that countries and cities were trying to get rid of. And so it's not the same as food because food is everywhere and there are a lot of policymakers, a lot of 
businesses, a lot of big money involved in promoting bad foods that I don't know if it's going to take multiple lawsuits when people start dying from diabetes and heart disease to cause them to change. It's not really a question, but more of a comment, but there is, um, yeah, there are a lot of people involved in the food industry that yeah, are responsible as well, and whether or not they'll ever be challenged or held accountable is, remains to be seen. Yes, uh, of course, I, 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 will, I w wanted to be provocative uh, saying the, about smoking. Of course, we need to continue saying what not to, to do in terms of uh, foods, in terms of, uh, of uh, lifestyle, of course. But I think in, in, in this pattern, in this way of talking, we need to change. We need not to be more restrictive because the person needs another approach in my opinion. The person I know uh, either don't know anything or know more than, than me. This is a problem because we don't have the middle, uh, the middle uh, information. They come to our ambulatory saying a lot of information from internet, website, wherever. So we need to, to change the natural way of eating. That's what the professor uh, Tricopoulos said. No one told us how to eat. But now we've, we have to teach a younger generation what, what to eat. This is true. But if the family doesn't teach, don't teach the, the younger generation, we, we failed because the, the society at the moment is not able to teach a younger generation to what to, uh, to eat in a correct way because the food industry is a, is a general thing, which is not bad in general, but we need to to uh, try to instruct or to teach also them what to do in terms of public health. And it's difficult, but... Anybody else, any, any comments? No, I, I mean, I, I would come back to that as well to say that um, I think there are beginning to be lawsuits against, uh, against food companies. There was a, a, a lawsuit by, I think, the, the state uh, in Aust one of the states in Australia against a food blogger who, a food blogger who was making claims uh, that her particular diet was curing cancer. Um, but it's also about policymakers, and Paolo referred to the statement from the last conference where we were uh, asking policymakers to take decisions to, uh, to, to encourage the food industry. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the carrot and the stick. Uh, so the, the rewards for the food industry when they do make changes, but also the potential stick of, of taxation policies. And um, in the UK, we have just uh, um, introduced a, a sugar tax, a levy on the, the sugar industry, which many, like myself, are saying doesn't go far enough, but is the beginning, and we're seeing it in Mexico, and I think in Denmark, some Scandinavian countries, and the more sanctions that are taken, uh, I, I think it'll be a mixed way forward to try to encourage industry to take a more responsible uh, attitude uh, to, to food and nutrition. Any other questions or or comments from the floor? Can I make a question to everyone? I mean, what do you think the Mediterranean diet is uh, a model we can transfer to every country uh, or it's just uh, a model to use as uh, suggesting other, other, I mean, is it sustainable or is it feasible to suggest all the countries to eat in our way and is uh, acceptable also? Or it's just an example we need to recommend to other, to other countries to find a good solution in their, in their conditions. Uh, Antonia. Yes. First of all, the Mediterranean diet movement started in the, after the KISS for several years. The teaching of KISS has been for, uh, forgotten. And then in the early 80s, when we start cutting the olive trees, and well, this is another story, uh, a group of people in Europe, who we, we, uh, we started uh, re rediscovering the Mediterranean diet. And I remember we did a, a seminar in Delphi, and the title was Mediterranean diet, when, why, what? In 1986, he was not there, maybe not. Later, he came, he came later, Francesco joined the group. Uh, 
I'm saying that because the beginning of this started as a reaction of the Mediterranean against westernizing our diet. When the diet, Mediterranean diet, after the 93 conference in Boston at Harvard, became international, and then we were rediscovered the Ansel Key study and all this that. It was a lot of interest from other countries. It's impossible, but today, even in the morning, I was talking local production, local consumption. How can I go to, the Sweden, to Sweden and say it's Mediterranean when there is this movement for sustainability and we say local production, local consumption? So, countries like, say, um, Northern European countries, Central European countries, I don't know where in another continent, America, United States, they can get a lot, a lot, a lot of lessons from the Mediterranean diet. And they can, and they have, first of all, if they want to adapt the culture of olive oil, because for me, olive oil is a magic food, which there are a lot of things to be discovered in the coming year, thanks to uh, our <laughs> pharmaco. Uh, so if they want to adapt the culture of olive oil, automatically they have to adapt to several elements of the Mediterranean diet. And one crucial point is to learn how to cook vegetables and legume with olive oil. Because in the Mediterranean area, when we cook vegetables and legumes with olive oil, we do not cook them simply with olive oil. We add all these fantastic uh, uh, herbs which he mentioned, oregano, parsley, mint, thyme. We add onion, garlic, tomato. At the end of the day, we have a multi-supplement. We have so many vitamins and minerals for one portion. That's the secret. That's the secret. So, the countries outside the Mediterranean, they have to learn, they have to adapt, and of course we are ready to contribute to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think this is a really interesting question as well. I mean, we do know that there are some other heritage traditional diets across the world which tend to be plant-based, which have got their own unique components which also are very beneficial and healthy and we have the blue zones described which are areas across the world including in Japan and in Costa Rica and so on where it's associated with very positive health but I think for me extra virgin olive oil being fundamental to the to the Mediterranean diet is, is an important question because um, can the Mediterranean sustain and or, or other countries on the 40 degree parallels like California and Australia is there the capacity to increase if the Mediterranean diet was to be adopted um, in, in other countries? I mean, I have my olive grove at home in England. I have an olive grove. Uh, I do, it, it consists of two trees, like, like your olive grove here. It consists of two trees and they're about that high and I'm hoping that if I eat enough meat, there will be a sufficient global warming <laughs> for in 20 years time for them to bear fruit and I will have my extra virgin olive oil. Um, but uh, that's not likely to happen. Um, so the, I, I guess a question I have is if, if I want to consu consume uh, a, a lot of extra virgin olive oil, which I do, and we are seeing increasing uh, import, you know, importing uh, of extra virgin olive oil to countries in northwestern Europe, for example, and places that haven't traditionally grown it, mind you, I sometimes think I'm personally responsible for that increase in extra virgin olive oil in the UK, because I'm probably consuming most of it. But, um, um, but you, you know, the question is, is there enough capacity to produce the extra virgin olive oil? <laughs> Probably Paolo could, could, could answer more than me, but, <laughs> but I think um, I was the one just to, to add some information to the discussion. Yesterday I was in Avellino where um, there, there was a meeting uh, of a Mediterranean diet and there was a um, professor, Franceschi, from the University of Bologna who is conducting a study, New Age, uh, in different countries 
in different countries, adopting, translating the Mediterranean diet in different countries. And he said that the same results, beneficial results, he had in Mediterranean diet in Italy, he doesn't, doesn't find in Poland, for example. And the, the theory was that if you change their, their dietary habits completely, because you just put uh, olive oil, you, you, put, uh, you send vegetables that were not uh, typical of Polish, they must change their microbiota more than what their genes can uh, afford or can accept. So the interaction between genes and microbiota that they were used to have uh, in their past, because they built and they was born in that way, probably it was not beneficial at the, at, in the short period, of course. Probably in the long period, so after 10 years, probably the beneficial effect uh, will come. But in the, in, in the short period, there was a, a, a reduction of some biomarkers or a, a worsening of some biomarkers. So the question is, uh, is it beneficial for all the countries? I mean, as a general thing. So if I just send the tomatoes from here to Polish, apart from the, the economical things and from the sustainable things. I just have a nutritional thing. Probably there is something we miss in this link because it's more important to find a, a local tradition there. Probably, I don't know, the garbage or the cauliflower, it's something which is local of there because the person adapted their microbiota to that foods. So this is one of the, the, the theory, I don't know. We need to think about it. We don't have all the information for answering to this, to this question, but it's probably one of the, the things we need to. Of course, the principles of Mediterranean that needs to be translated. And olive oil is one, probably the, one exam, the only example we, we can change in other, in, other, in other diets. But the other things, I'm a little bit sceptical. I don't know if Francesco knows. No. <laughs> Any uh, comment? Paolo, there, is it sustainable the production of olive oil for, uh, for every country <laughs> of the world? The only thing I know is that everybody's trying to, uh, to, to plant new orchards in China, in, uh, in uh, South America. So everybody understood that we are, uh, you know, as Mediterranean people, we have something so important as olive tree. So it's natural that everyone tries to get it. But you know, I'm up to your scientific results and evidence. I'm not sure that the Mediterranean diet could be, uh, well, of course it's essential that is uh, uh, based on olive oil, but well, this is a personal approach. Uh, I don't think that we are what we eat. I think we are mainly what we think to eat. <laughs> so on this side, you know, to think what you are eating and is just to know is an invitation to reflect and think on what you think to eat. So at the end of the day, uh, we need to create a bridge. Uh, and I was impressed by the simple but so efficient uh, notes of Antonia that uh, in our generation, we have never been told what is good and what is bad. Now we are here. <laughs> and that's fantastic, you know, because it's a big challenge. And so that's why we should start from children. We should start again to make them play and get pleasure with food. Thank you. Any more questions or comments from the audience? Please, if there's a burning question. OK. I can, Any other I can comments? No, another, another comment. I, um, the one of the other theory is coming up to, to, um, to um, answer to the beneficial effect of, of uh, Mediterranean diet is the Ormesis, Ormesis theory. So the Ormesis, Ormesis theory is something that uh, related to the toxic, toxic substances that uh, green products produce. Because if you think at the, for example, resveratrol, the resveratrol uh, is produced by the green leaves uh, or the, by the grapes uh, in, in uh, response to a stress of the grass. So it is is a defensive approach of the grass, of the of the grapes or of the vegetable. We eat this in a small 
components in small uh, amounts, and these small amounts of the toxic substances is beneficial for us. So Mediterranean diet is probably one a diet which is full of toxic compounds, but taking in small compounds. A combination. This is the arm. Uh, I, 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 I just wrote a, a paper on this <laughs> and, and, and other ones in the past. No, that's uh, because, uh, okay. <laughs> one, one minute. Yes, sure. it, it's, a, it's a complete uh, change of paradigm. So we keep hearing about antioxidants, antioxidants, antioxidants. There's no clinical trial that antioxidants are good for your health. None. I mean, he knows clinical trials. <laughs> so beta carotene, we saw that. You take beta carotene, you increase mortality. But why? You, vitamin E doesn't do anything. Vitamin C, there are no real clinical trials. And uh, so, so the new theory is that exactly of what they call xenohormesis or parahormesis. That means that if you take, it's like, uh, it's like uh, a vaccine. If you take uh, compounds that are toxic to you, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, you eat an apple and that contains toxic compounds. In fact, you don't, you don't store them. You don't have a store for polyphenols in your body. You store fat, you store protein, you store sugars, you store some vit vitamins, but you do not store polyphenols. You do not store anything. In fact, you get rid of them as fast as you can. As fast as you can. Your body is built to, we have enzymes, to con it's called to conjugate these, these small molecules, make them water soluble, and then pff, eliminate them as soon as you can with the urine. By doing this, you also eliminate toxins, you eliminate proteins that are misfolded, not perfectly formed, you eliminate contaminants from the air, you eliminate uh, inflammatory molecules that are produced in excess. So what we keep calling, we kept calling antioxidants, the, the antioxidant theory died about 10 years ago. Well, we keep, we keep hearing it on, on TV or newspapers because it's easy to understand. But in truth, you take, you, you ingest toxic compounds Moderately toxic, okay? I'm not saying that a carrot is toxic, but it contains slightly toxic compounds that activate detoxification enzymes in your body. By doing this, you sort of fortify yourself. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, and that applies also to, to herbs, spices, and all these beautiful uh, vegetable dishes that they have in Crete and, and all Greece. And, and, and that also applies to olive oil, probably. In, in, so we, you, you get out of here, and when you hear that you, we produce free radicals and you eat, we eat antioxidants, that's an old theory. It's, it's finished. It's, it's, a, it's a different thing. We activate our body, and we activate our defenses. Okay. I hope it's clear enough. Uh, Antonio, come in on that. He made to me a present, a big present. <laughs> Several years ago, well, you... Not you, many, you, not many. Uh, not many, uh, 10, 15, okay. 20. <laughs> yeah, 20. Uh, no, 20. But uh, several years ago, uh, well, we were fighting for olive oil. At that time, because the story of Mediterranean diet, it's, it's not so easy. Now everybody accepts it. At that time, the Mediterranean diet was accused that it's fattening because it's high in olive oil. It's 30, 35% of the energy in days from olive oil. You remember? Yeah, yeah. So at that time also, we were trying to say, where they were saying, okay, olive oil is monosaturated, so you can have a rapeseed oil. And then we were saying, but olive oil is not only monosaturated, it cannot be replaced by soya oil or rapeseed oil, because it's high in monosaturated oil, rapeseed oil, because it has 400 micro components. <laughs> and then Francesco, and me and several others, you Mediterranean, you know, were going to the international conferences. They were saying, what do you do not have data? I mean, it's monosaturated. Soya oil has monosaturated. Rapeseed oil. Mediterranean diet, it's fattening. So we're saying, you know, we're trying to say that here is something which is important. And with Francesco, we were saying, what is happening to these micro components? And then a big study supported by Unilever. Yeah. And then it was fed with olive oil with a lot of antioxidants. And then we were waiting for two years in order to have data and to say it's beyond monosaturated the olive oil. Yeah. And then uh, they didn't appear in the blood. 
the antioxidants of olive oil, the micro components. It was for our great, great disappointment. Yeah. What happening? I mean, they were getting extra virgin olive oil with a lot of the accident. Then it was you and your group pharmacologists. Yeah, we found it in the urine. They found in the urine, and then a Spanish yeah. Ma Maribel. They found that because they were talking the blood five minutes after the intake. In five minutes, they disappear from the blood because the blood gets rid of them. But in, during these five minutes, in, in the two, one or two minutes that they are in the blood, a Spanish colleague, Maribel, found out that they have fantastic antioxidant capacity uh, in, uh, in the oxidation of uh, the low-density lipoproteins. But the body gets rid of them in five minutes, in, uh, you remember. So that means what? That means that, of course, we need to study these microcomponents. It's needed to study the antioxidants. But please be careful. When we translate it to everyday diet, we mean that we take them with food, not as pills. Because this probably clarify why the foods are good in the right amount and not in the higher amount. Every food. If you take a orange, okay, vitamin C, and if you consume one kilo of uh, vitamin C, of course you have the detrimental effect because it probably is, of course, it's something which is a toxic effect of vitamin C, but also with the toxic effect of these small compounds, we consume in, in a low amount if you consume a varied diet with different things. So this, is, this is probably clarifies all the things, this, or this theory. But this is correct, because the, the green, the, plower, the flowers, the plants, just create or some, just uh, uh, the, the defense from the, or just give a response to the stress. And this, we, we eat this stress oxidants, uh, sorry, the stress substances, just to uh, strengthen our body. This is what we... Thank you. That's a wonderfully clear explanation of the antioxidant theory and the, and, and the, and the, and the micro components of, of, of olive oil and other foods. Thank you. Any other questions for the floor or from the floor or we can we'll go proceed to the, next, uh, to the next section. So I'll hand over now to uh, Francesco to chair the next section where we'll hear more about food and, and, and marketing and then we can go and top up on our antioxidants because they've, the ones we had at breakfast are already gone, so. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much.